Welcome to the CTA podcast. Join us as we critically examine the ideological capture of the psychotherapy field. Here we discuss better common humanity proposals for a fairer society. Our discussions are thought provoking and our guests are from diverse backgrounds bringing unique perspectives to the table. This is the CTA podcast with your hosts Yaku van Seyl and Christine Seifen. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the Critical Therapy Antidote podcast with myself, Jakub van Sel and Christine Seifen. And we're delighted to have Dr. Lucas Klein as our guest today. Lucas Klein is a clinical psychologist and psychoanalyst. He is a former forensic psychologist. He's a published author and the host of the Real Clear podcast. And I have to say it's been a delight listening to some of your podcasts there, Lucas. Um, I recently listened to your interview with Don Carveth, and I really found it rather, rather riveting, to say the least. Well, thank you very much. Uh, the pleasure is mine. Thanks for having me on. So there's a lot going on around us, Lucas. There's a lot to comment on. There are quite a few interesting thinkers to interview. It almost feels to me like there is too much to say and there's too little time. Maybe you can give us just a bit of a background. How did you get interested? How did you get involved in talking around the social political issues that are gripping many of our attention today? I've been interested for quite some time. Uh, in fact, as I was going through my dissertation uh, back in 2010 through through 2012 or so, I was contemporaneously writing a book on the uh, scamming culture that underlies the mental health disability system in America. And I did, in fact, publish a book. Um, and, and, you know, I was quite passionate about finding ways to address uh, political issues through a psychological prism. Mm -hmm. So I've been doing that for a while. And I became invigorated, we might say, in 2020. Mm -hmm. That was really a flashpoint for me. Mm -hmm. It was a flashpoint for the whole country. And for context, I was living in Portland, Oregon and practicing there. Um, and the entire place came apart. Psychologically had a mass regression, had a psychosis as a culture. And uh, the entire area was unable, along with the country, unable to address actual reality through evidence. Mm -hmm. And I found that to be so alarming so moving that I started to write about the issues that I saw around me and began my podcast at that time under yeah. a different name. And I've just not stopped. Um, and I must say that uh, society has not stopped giving me ample material to dig through, as I'm sure it yeah. has not stopped providing you the same. Yeah, absolutely. It's interesting you're using the two expressions, mass regression and psychosis. It sounds quite familiar to me. Um, I've been a, a fan of Vamik Volkan, who's a psychoanalyst, Cypriot psychoanalyst. And he's written a lot around narcissistic regression of masses. So maybe you can say, tell us a bit more about mass regression and psychosis. What do you mean by that? Sure. Um, Matthias Desmond wrote a book. Uh, regarding mass delusional psychosis, mm -hmm. and uh, he analyzed things from a largely macro level, uh, from a general psychological level. So I take the term, I borrow it uh, from Desmond, uh, okay. Desmond and others. Um, what I think I mean by mass, mass psychosis is that some sort of an undergirding shift occurs in societies mm -hmm. at various times, as happened in 2020 and continues to along various lines where people become entirely convicted um, about outcomes that cannot be substantiated with any kind of empirical evidence. And that's what I'm talking about. Um, you, might, you might consider delusion to be defined most broadly as a belief whose validity cannot and will not be put up for debate, right? 
and that's the important part I'm going to jump in is the fact that there is no space for debate, right? This is what makes it mm -hmm. extremely dangerous is that the narrative leaves no room for an opposing point of view or an opposing conversation, even discussion, that's right? right? Censorship, people getting deplatformed, et cetera. No, that's right. That's exactly right, Christine. Uh, so mass delusional psychosis simply means society upholding a series of belief structures about various topics uh, through which there can be no debate. And uh, moreover, of course, I mean, I'm getting a little far afield here. We'll get more detailed as uh, I'm sure the podcast goes on. When you talk to someone who is in the grips of narcissistic personality organization, all right, who is operating along those lines of personality development, anytime you question about details and convictions, you're going to get quite a primitive reaction. And so I've started to see that across society writ large, uh, mm. where it used to be, I think, less pronounced. We're seeing that become so much more typical of the average citizen. Uh, and I find that alarming. And that's why I started writing about these issues. Yeah. Would you say that there was one single precipitating event that triggered this break into mass regression and psychosis? Or would you say that there was, that, that there may have been one, more than one yes. precipitating event? The culture has been shifting mm -hmm. to become more and more bizarre for many years yep. now. But obviously the flashpoint in the United States was George Floyd. Yes, okay. we fell off a cliff with George Floyd and COVID. Yes, that, that's right. Uh, there the were... draconian, the com total draconian measures that were taken and people just did it. That's Without right. Question. There were lots of reasons for uh, the way the country reacted to George Floyd, uh, as Christine is saying, contextualized by us being locked down and uh, a lot of young men full of aggression being uh, pent up and indoors and so forth mm. and looking for purpose. Yes. But however you split that, uh, the flashpoint was George Floyd. Mm -hmm. And how do I know that? Because an entire series of, I think, spiritual and religious wars started to take place. Um, you couldn't ask the question, are police really going around the country hunting down black men? Is that actually happening? If you asked that question in 2020, you would get a violent reaction from people, a violent reaction, an emotionally wretched reaction, just for asking the question. Now, if you went as far as I did, and actually looked up the research and spent five minutes with the data and then told people who did not want to hear that, uh, actually, you're wrong. That's not happening. The data doesn't bear any of that out. You would be shunned. You would be looked at as an actual a cultural interloper between the present state and some sort of utopian outcome that everyone was sure was going to fall on the tails of this revolution, as it were. And you know what the revolution produced? A 60% reduction in police force throughout the United States. I'm not sure if people overseas where you are, Yaku, are aware of that. The United States is unpoliced mm -hmm. right now. Okay. Mm -hmm. Completely. We have balkanized regions of crime called cities, and we have 60% reduced police force throughout the United States. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because, again, we were in the midst of a mass psychosis. No one was paying attention to the realistic outcomes of their ideology. They simply knew they were right, irrespective of empirical evidence. They were not willing to look at the world as it is and make peace with reality as it exists. Yes. You use the term in one of your articles, and I love it, personality disordered, maniacal that people, we had personality disordered, maniacal people that were actually calling the shots, fr framing the narrative, framing the ideology and recruiting victims or those who are oppressed to their cause, because that's also part of it, right? Is they mm -hmm. started recruiting people, the kind of the, the cult function there of recruiting the most vulnerable to join in this mission to create something that's an, a utopian impossibility, which I don't even think people that, I don't even think people that are at the, at the forefront of this movement even believe that that's possible themselves. I think that's, that in and of itself is one of 
the driving issues is that it is used to create agendas to accomplish things politically and socially that have nothing to do with utopian outcomes. That's a very interesting way of putting it. And what it brings up for me is that I have really been wondering how much of what's been happening is conspiratorial, is conscious, is actually targeted from certain actors versus is an implicit shift on yes. the parts of people who otherwise don't understand uh, the outcomes of what they're moving toward. Um, at this point, I think that there are there are malevolent actors to some extent, very rarely, probably at the level of policymaking. Um, yet even those people I see as so ideologically captured that they're not aware of their own, of their own movement. Um, and so that's actually kind of a worse situation. Uh, what I'm saying is a bit worse, that people are um, gripped by an inability to contend with reality to such an extent that they don't even know that that's a problem. Yes. Right? So as I often say to patients, especially say a patient is complaining about uh, a very troubled spouse, a pathological spouse, um, I'll often say, look, A, B, C, D, A, B, C, and D is the uh, problem with your spouse. But the real problem is that they don't know that that's a problem, right? And that's where we are right now as a society. Um, most of the people uh, who you will run into, especially in a blue state right now, are unaware that they have any kind of a worldview or epistemological uh, stance that makes contending with actual reality impossible for them. Mm. It's a very grim place for society to be. Mm. So there is an impairment of reflexivity. There is just instinctive participation and in instincts. I've said in the past before that in mass movements, there are only three possible experiences. And that is intense desire or greed, intense aggression, and intense fear. And when regression takes place, it is almost as if there is this hive mind that's being created, this mob mentality, and everybody participating in that mob mentality just goes along with the potent affect of the mass. Well, I think because the way that these movements are couched or framed has a lot to do with that. If you look at diversity, equity, and inclusion, that sounds very nice on paper. And when you look at how they taught about diversity or an earlier, pro when I was going to school, the school I ended up teaching at, uh, diversity was a conversation about the people that you see is your clients are going to be different from you. And because of that, you need to have kind of this open you know, you need to be open to that and not make assumptions, right? And be questioning and be curious and be wondering and dig in, okay? So that was beautiful. That's wonderful. We all want to do that. We believe in diversity. But then at some point, right, this gets hijacked and twisted, okay, in the hands of perhaps these personality disordered my, my <laughs> maniacal people who actually have some power in society. So part of this problem, I mean, the way that I see it is that you have people that are driving this using words that sound really nice and really, really inclusive and really friendly. It doesn't sound aggressive in any way. That's right. It's, that's right. Right. So that's one of the biggest problems. The left has had a much greater romance with the uh, language games than the right has had. And this has a um, it's got quite a philosophical history behind it, by the way. Um, Wittgenstein. Uh, was a phenomenologist of sorts and uh, wrote quite prolifically about um, what is essentially a hermeneutical manner of uh, falling into uh, language games whereby um, you're not actually attending to uh, objects in the world themselves. You're simply bewitched by concepts of things. And a, a school of thought that followed in his wake and which was um, typified, I'd say, characterized by the phenomenologists and then the postmodernists for sure, um, Derrida and Foucault and the like, mm -hmm. certainly Heidegger to a large extent, who gave rise to them, um, uh, wrote a canon of what is essentially a doctrine that says uh, it's hard to look at things in the world as they are. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and this involves the Heisenberg principle, an object that motion can't uh, steadily and reliably predict or uh, gain an objective grasp of the velocity of an object in its sight. And the postmodernists took these basic truths to be an inlet for mm. sociological malevolence. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they parlayed that into a, a sociological um, lens where um, nothing is better than anything else. If something's claimed to be better than anything else, that is absolutely uh, likely given to you from a power structure, um, mm. the powerful control language. And thereby, therefore, we should enter into a language game in order to have a coup d'etat and mm. fight against the oppressive forces in the world that we see as dominating the very structure of society. That's where we are right now, yeah. is the actual uh, um, battle moment, if I could put it that way, between that school of thought and the school of thought where we're using, uh, with the metaphysics, we're using language to, as best we can to describe phenomena that we see so that we can uh, uh, aspire to gain a grasp of truth. And that's how, by the way, our university systems were set up right from the academy to aspire toward grasping uh, some measure of truth. And the new university system that has been uh, absolutely decaying the original academy uh, says uh, truth isn't important. That's simply, that is simply a concept put forth by the elite, and we're here to tear it down. Mm -hmm. Dismantle. That's why, so Christine, when you bring up language, uh, yes. you're absolutely right. That is one of the greatest tools that the postmodernists are using to, uh, and the, the critical social justice warriors who are like postmodernists on steroids. Um, they, they're using language to influence society. It's, it was very chilling for me. The school that I graduated from and used to went back to teach at, they were having their graduation the other day and somebody forwarded it to me because, you know, they knew I used to teach there and, you know, a good uh, friend of mine and um, podcaster Leslie Elliott was a student at the school and sort of broke her silence about the curriculum. Anyhow, part of the speech from the chancellor was about a couple of people, I guess he would say, that created a storm for the school, attacking it for being woke. And then stand, and then two seconds later says, and I'm proud to say we are woke. And the entire class started cheering and clapping and standing ovation. And so that was, I mean, it was so chilling because that is the social justice warrior group that is the very next group of therapists that are going mm -hmm. to be seeing your child, your partner, your friend, your mother, your daughter, your son, you, that's what's happening. That's where they are right now. Just venturing off into the world, owning, being woke and having a conversation, essentially addressing the people that challenged what this woke curriculum was and saying we're damn proud of it so we don't want to have a conversation we're not having a conversation we're right this is what we're doing and this is the next group of warriors to get out there and to become those activists and shut down dissidents anybody who has a dissenting opinion and um it was chilling i'm sure it was but for a community for a society to regress into narcissistic uh, regressiveness or in, into mass delusion. There's got to be conditions under which the society had actually been prepared to be ready for a moment of regression like that, not so. And I think one of the, one of the things was, may have been the political landscape um, under, under Don, Donald Trump, um, as well as the re response from media houses to his presidency. Along with that must have been the saturation of various key institutions of this resentment ideology that had already been developed over the previous several years. And when the right event took place, the instigators could just move in and elaborate on that and make that the moment of crisis bring about that regression what do you think Lucas? 
Well, it's very well put. The only factor that I would add mm -hmm. in all of that in terms of social context is social media. Of course. Um, that's the gasoline on the fire. And um, if you think about how borderline personality organization works, mm -hmm. and I'm referring to Otto Kernberg, uh, the, the organization itself, um, the more primitive organization of the mind that you find amongst some people, mm -hmm. social media is designed for it and around it. Because what do you find on, uh, on social media? You find highly aggressive people who do not have their thoughts mediating their emotions, and they're able to discharge aggression uh, to a much greater extent on their fellow citizens than the rest of us who are thinking about our impulses first. And I think you're right, Yaku. That was, in addition to the factors you've described, the perfect storm for a borderline organization structure to emerge in society. And that's probably one of the reasons why we're so primitive right now. Yeah. And then I think um, an, an aspect around social media use would be this disinhibition that we see online, but also, again, in masses, in these online mobs that are being formed. Well, and I think, you know, organization also has happened using social media. We, we've had in the past week or so here, we've had two mob uh, robberies, okay, in, a, in two major department stores, not too far from where I, I live, actually, maybe 20 miles, where 50 or more people rushed in mm -hmm. as a mob and That's right, started at Nordstrom. at Nordstrom, right? They went to one and then they went to the other to steal because the law is that anything under a thousand dollars will not be prosec prosecuted. So there, if you're talking about regression, I, I recently heard a young person say, well, I took some things, but you know, what's the big deal? These are, you know, multi-million dollar, hundreds of million dollars. Even Walmart was one place that was stolen from too billions even in certain cases industries so i should be able to just take what i want so if we're talking about regression we're having people that are in their 20s 30s ish what age of li stage of life is that right four years old maybe it starts five years old you kind of need you start learning about it's not your it's not yours you cannot touch i mean there's there's a regression to that i want it i'm gonna have it now and I'm going to organize on social media and I'm going to do it and it doesn't matter. I mean, so I'm sort of getting to this point here that the regression and the organization at the same time is making it so much more powerful because now these people can connect and ignite fire and add fuel to it and plan to actually terrorize and, and go out there uh, fulfilling those desires. Yes, that's I, right. You know, and and you're touching upon... I love a free pass at Nordstrom to go buy whatever I wanted and walk right on out with it without paying. I mean, that's right? right. There, that, that's, that's not an unusual desire. Yeah, no it's kidding. just we manage them. We develop. We mature, right? Our senses of self and ego and all of those points that, that are put together, that is dismantled right now. Yes. You're bringing up a very important issue, a series of them, Christine. Um, one of them is that... Psychopathy is really nothing more than an extreme extension of narcissism, uh, mm -hmm. clinically and structurally in the mind. That's what psychopathy is. And uh, we are witnessing a profound uh, explosion of psychopathic behavior in the populace, and largely because of the expanded narcissistic um, uh, uh, model of the mind that is now um, typifying the average citizen. Um, we've got people who view the world as, through a contextual lens. They think that if they have a sense of distress, that the world has done that to them. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes that's the case, uh, obviously, as in the case with trauma, uh, real trauma. I don't mean uh, you feel emotionally upset and then you're traumatized. Yes. Um, but real trauma can can actually victimize people but we have a a movement growing and i don't mean a conscious movement but i mean an implicit movement that is now uh, underfoot where young people don't have a self they they are fragmented um 
they're very primitively organized uh, and, and this is terrible for them. Uh, 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 prognostically, yes. this is terrible for them in terms of how their future is going to unfold. And I'm very worried for them and society. Um, they, they view themselves as a product of an external world such that when they experience something internally, they believe that their feelings are a veridical representation of external mm -hmm. reality. Now, mm -hmm. you and Yaku know as I say that, that that is a description of narcissistic personality disorder. Yes. Okay. And so the Nordstrom uh, sacking was an extreme psychopathic uh, outburst that represents a, a narcissistic core that's growing in society where individuals do not experience themselves as a self at all, but rather as a passive recipient of an oppressive world when they feel agitated. And, well, if their internal state is a veridical representation of external oppression, then why wouldn't they be justified in laying waste mm -hmm. to their perceived oppressors? Sure. Okay. Yeah. So if you combine what I just said with an absent police force, remember, 60% reduction in precincts, you have a fatherless society. You have a society where the psychopathic young men can go around unleashing aggression in an entitled temper tantrum. And mm -hmm. there's no dad to come and say, you can't do this. I mean, I wrote about the Nordstrom sacking last week on a Real Clear podcast, and I had a short uh, episode on it, just a monologue. And I encourage people to think to themselves when they watch the video, imagine that that's your house mm. and it's just you standing there. And these young men burst in. And by the way, they were carrying bear mace. Mm. Okay. Uh, imagine that that's the case. What are you going to do? But, um, you know, people aren't supposed to own firearms. Uh, yes. That's a sign of primitive functioning, uh, according to... Yes. left side of the political spectrum you're not supposed to own firearms and you're not supposed to call the police i guess what you're supposed to do is leave your door open with a sign that says <laughs> um mikasa es su casa i mean it's ridiculous to, to put context around it's so it's ridiculous yako you wanted to jump in i think yeah i'm, I'm thinking about some further societal factors that may have contributed to this. Um, I have said this before also in other podcasts that there have been several generations of relative ease in America. And it wasn't just mm -hmm. life of ease. It yes. was also the discourse that society is responsible for your ease. In other words, when there is limitation or when it's the way, where, where, where you encounter restriction, that is perceived as unfair. That is perceived as a withholding of something I am entitled to. And that is where this envious impulse gets triggered. And I've written, Christine, you mentioned my articles. I've written on that, the, the, the Kleinian concept of envy, where I perceive the other as having surplus i feel entitled to their surplus because i feel entitled but also self-idealized i don't think that i need to do the necessary work to also obtain that surplus instead i either rob them of their surplus or i destroy their surplus so neither of us have it what do you think of that Yes, that's right. Uh, Yaku, I was waiting until you made that last point, and I'm glad you did, because the situation is much worse than uh, people are envious and try to attain what others have as either possessions or characteristics. The way you ended up there is, is quite right. Um, Otto Kernberg, the giant in the field of psychoanalysis, who synthesized all of the uh, theories on narcissistic and borderline functioning, uh, would say that hatred and envy are very, very different. Uh, hatred is a dislike and disdain for something that is deemed to be bad. Mm -hmm. But envy is actually much worse and stranger. It is a maniacal aim to destroy that which is desired, which mm -hmm. is seen as good mm -hmm. about the other. 
And so if you think about this, if there are any analysts listening uh, in terms of object relations, uh, and you're, a, a, you're wondering about a narcissistic person who is now targeting uh, someone else with um, a discharge of aggression, um, they're trying to destroy that which is enviable, which is the same thing as saying they're trying to destroy that which is good in the other. And you know, I, I think that explains a lot about what uh, Christine mentioned she's seeing in society. Uh, very, very strange behavior, even in, um, even in unlikely places uh, mm -hmm. uh, where things that are pillars of normality are being targeted for destruction. I think that probably has something to do with how disabled people are now experiencing themselves as. They can't fit into a category, so destroy the category. They can't get something, so let's destroy that as even being seen as good, which is far worse than people being envious and then trying to pursue an acquisition of those things. So this is almost worse than the Marxist scheme. Yes. It's not like you yes. have the proletariat trying to acquire what the bourgeoisie have. You actually have now a proletariat, in a sense, who are trying to destroy the perception of what the bourgeoisie have as being good. Mm. So it's far worse mm. um, than I think something we've seen in modern history. Now, if I may continue just a little bit further, um, Please. Yaku, you had mentioned that we have several generations of um, uh, 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 positive economic conditions and so forth in the United States. There's a very broad issue, a long-term issue that I've, I've been wondering about, and I want to get both of your perspectives on this because it's not very, very well thought through. It's not refined. But as far as I see it, um, after World War II, the United States entered into such a period of wealth and prosperity, uh, the likes of which had never been seen before in modern society. Um, something happened economically and monetarily to where that, that, could, not, um, that could not be sustainable for, uh, for very mm. long. And we, we might be witnessing a sort of decline um, since that point, actually, where uh, social expectations for economic prosperity were set in motion from the 1950s, yes. and subsequent generations uh, were not able to achieve the same kind of lifestyle. For instance, homeownership since 1978 has gone down by 10%, whereby the population has increased dramatically. So when you compound those two realities, you've got a very disgruntled youth coming about. And, mm -hmm. you know, to wit, they don't have access to capital the same yes. way that their predecessors did. So why would any of us expect them to be excited about capitalism? The idea is that you do better than your parents, right? That was what was in our minds is that we were going to supersede what our parents that's how we continue to build prosperity is that you achieve even more than your parents the generation that follows you achieves even more than you did and that's how we keep this kind of ponzi scheme structure set up which was bound to burst that's my opinion about that that's we're saying it, a similar it, thing it was not, yes yeah it's not sustainable at all but the expectation is that you and this is the first generation, and maybe it's mine, maybe I think it's a generation behind me that, you know, most most will not own homes um, the way that their parents did. They won't be able, there's no capital, as you said. There's no ability to do that. And uh, that that feeling of, I should be able to have all of these things. I'm, I, I'm, I learned from childhood that the world is my oyster. And if I work hard, then I'm going to be able to afford X, Y, and Z. That's not the case. You can work hard and still not be able to afford a house. I mean, many people can't, especially in a place like California. Right. So there is maybe some of that built up, you know, gee, this isn't what I thought it was going to be. This is not what I was told. I was told that I can do and be what I want. I will attain more and I will always do better than my parents will. Right. And they are, my own kids will do better than me. They will supersede. And that's not, it's like, it's like you said, it's just not sustainable. And that's possibly that burst that you're talking about. Because um, I know that I felt that pressure growing up and that's what the, the messaging was growing up. And what an injury to the self. Sure. The home is a contextual, uh, a contextual aspect of selfhood. 
And so this may contribute to yeah. why this newest generation has a shakier sense of self than previous generations. At least that's my, my observation of them. I don't know what you see over there, Yaku. I, I agree with you. Um, and I also think that this, this thesis needs to be developed a bit more. I remember your interview with Don Carveth, and he mentioned that it is purely thanks to unbridled capitalism that we are sitting with the narcissism that we are currently sitting with. I, my opinion is that it is a very, it is a very, in my opinion, and I have immense respect for Don Carver. I think it is rather naive to think that Marxism would have done a better job because you would, you would sit with the same kind of people and we all have capacity for greed. So if we take the Marxist maxim, each according to their ability, to each according to their need, who will decide who's able or not? And who will decide what is a need and what is a want? I'm so glad you brought that up. So with, we, we're dealing with Yes, uh, Yaku, I don't know if you're... Continue. Yaku, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but you brought up such a profoundly important point. Um, Marx never addresses the question that you are raising. He leaves and, it completely absent. And those who do address it, namely those who were responsible for the subjective turn of the critical theorists, they seem to be as captivated by the idealistic idea of a utopia as Marx, as Marx was about his utopian idea of an economically free society. Or a, or a communist society. Because we're still bound by subjectivity and subjectivity can easily be confused, can easily be deceived by factors beyond our subjective control. And sadly, that is why we sometimes do need real limitation, limitation that that, that, that brings us into confrontation with reality such that we can adjust our own subjectivity to that limitation. And if we're living in such a prosperous society as Marcuse said we were, that the, the, the surplus of production could now be used so that people can truly live in ease and have this perverse existence where we're no longer excessively repressed. And that that would be the solution to our qualm. I mean, that is such a naive take on Marxism from a subjectivity perspective. Well, um, very well stated. And, and yes, there again, you see the basic epistemological problem of modern society. Hmm. Whereas Marxism involves wiping the chessboard clean and pretending that evidence is not evidence. Uh, we have a new generation of people mm -hmm. who are inherently a Marxist uh, epistemologically because they're looking at the world, as you say, through a naive subjective lens mm -hmm. rather than developing into mature adulthood and taking a look at worldwide economic history and saying, Wherever Marxism has been in place, it has been a disaster. You can call it Marxism, you can call it Maoism, Stalinism, whatever you want. Uh, a lot of the academic theorists sit in their ivory towers and say, none of that was Marxism as it was supposed to be uh, implemented. Uh, and what an arrogant statement. Uh, their statement is, I know how it's supposed to be implemented. And I'll tell you, that's a very, very terrifying uh, um, uh, position for someone to occupy. And people are gripped by this for some reason. That's troubling, right? In previous generations mm -hmm. of American history, especially, uh, people would bristle just at the term Marxism. And now uh, uh, equity, uh, which is just a socially subversive mechanism of, of, the, same, uh, mm -hmm. of the same philosophy, is 
roving through the country, seeping through every little crack that it can get in. And it does so because people are no longer willing to be empirical. They're no longer willing to look at evidence in the world. So it's the same wine in a different bottle as happened well, with we George have no Floyd. Contain- there's no containment, no guardrails. And people need containment and guardrails to function, right? In your family and in the world at large, in society, by removing all of these guardrails and the containment that we've had in the structure, that people are spinning out of control. This society is spinning out of control because everything now is okay. Everything now is acceptable. Everything now has become a reflection of you. So if it's your identity to go and steal every weekend, that's perfectly fine because that's how you identify. I mean, these crazy ways of identifying oneself, that is now to be accepted. And there is no containment. There is no guardrail. There is no boundary that says that's not so. That cannot be so in order for a society to function. We've got to have the guardrails and they're not anywhere to be found. Christine, you're referring to indulgence, unbridled indulgence. I, I, I realize that because of the competition present in capitalism, those who were able to learn the rules of the game managed to gain the necessary resources through competition so as to enjoy those, those resources. I get that. And because of that, and because of generations of built up resources, we find ourselves in a state of extreme indulgence, unbridled indulgence. I don't see how Marxism would have prevented this. Because a person who's entitled, who's able, but who believes to be incapable of obtaining what they need, could just as well indulge and become entitled and resentful and envious and destructive, no matter the economic system. At least within the previous generations, we had a religious structure of some sort that frowned upon indulgence. Now that's mm-hmm. gone too. Well, mm-hmm. more, we leaned more on morality, integrity, I mean, basic values of the human condition and what you need, right? Choosing not to do something or to do something, not because it's legal or illegal, but simply because it just wasn't right mm. or it's, or, or, or it was wrong. And that's from, that's, that's a moral develop, you know, moralistic development, right? Yeah. I mean, that, you know, they, you know, children start off by not doing something so they don't get in trouble, right? As time goes on and they develop, they start mm. to learn mm. that they're going to not do something no more just to not get caught, but because there is a, you know, a core intrinsic wrongness to that action. So I'm not going to kill someone, not just because I'll go to jail, but because I believe it's the wrong way to handle my feelings or it's the wrong way to handle my whatever it is, my, my, my aggression. That is completely, that's, that's, that's completely been snuffed out. Yes, Christine, I, I think that's put very well. And Jaku, great, great um, a lead in there. Uh, my own reaction to uh, what both of you have said is that, um, well, we now have a religion called emotional sensitivity. And that's why you see people so preoccupied with themselves and not with the external world. And it's very difficult to talk with someone else about um, external reality and what's occurring in it. In other words, what's true in the world as you see it. If they're mainly focused on Uh, an internal conviction, an Mm -hmm. internal sensation. Um, So that's that's something that's growing dramatically and is making dialogue very difficult. Uh, I've said in in earlier episodes of my own that we have a religious impulse that has just been displaced. It's been shifted onto onto other domains of of society. Um, We we see it displaced onto now race, uh, gender, Mm-hmm. Um, I believe gender as a concept uh, is probably just a secular version of the soul. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's why it's so hotly contested and talked about in, in religious terms. Mm. Um, by the way, everyone should know gender is not an actual thing. No, it's it a, is it's not. It's an academic concept uh, created by John Money in the 1960s. Um, and it was refined by uh, others in the late 1980s. 
when things started to come undone. But it's, it's not an actual thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and this ties into what we were talking about much earlier, language games. Uh, gender probably has been the most successful language game takeover in the mm. 20th century, right? Mm. Because people now experience uh, gender, they, when they talk about gender, they, they reference it as though and they truly believe it's a physical thing. Yes. It, it's not. It's an no. academic theory. It's a concept. It's a concept. Um, and what it really is, is a proxy for personality. Mm. So, uh, but again, to question that, as I just did, for many people, would be to overstep religious bounds. Yes. Full stop. <laughs> right. I think we're on the same page there. And I don't think, um, I, I, want to, I want to just say something and maybe we can go to a, a, a bit of a further development in our, in, our, in our discussion. I don't think anything we three say tonight will have a butterfly effect and change the world. But I think it is worth asking for the sake of the individuals who might be receptive of it. And I'm sure a lot of people will be receptive to, to what we're discussing. My question is seeing that we're dealing with masses now and seeing that we find ourselves in a state of mass narcissistic regression. What is left for us to do? Yes, uh, Yaku, I have a lot to say about this. So uh, buckle up, okay? Um, what are we to do? We three sitting here tonight are part of a very, very small group of people. The field of mental health has been entirely taken over and is lost. I have gained a tremendous amount from the field of psychoanalysis, but my beloved field has been uh, radically overthrown. I wouldn't be who I am today without my analyses. I've been incredibly fortunate to have very skilled people helping me. The opportunity for future generations to undergo a proper psychotherapeutic process is in peril. One of the greatest advents to the function of civilization was the psychoanalytic tradition. That tradition has been overthrown. In fact, recently, the American Psychoanalytic Association, of which I am a member, held a forum to try to discuss, finally try to discuss, the critical social justice warrior takeover of analysis. I was glad that they were finally talking about it. But I must say, when I watched the video, it was the most careful. Yes, too late and ground-giving um, expose of the very thing that allowed the CSJ people to start infiltrating our field. And so I don't know how many of us there are left to talk plainly like we are here, how many people are willing to be simply truthful and honest with people about what's going on in society. That used to be the role of the psychotherapy field and of analysis, yes. by the way. It was not to make people feel better about their inner convictions. It was to help them contend with reality in a more straightforward manner so that they could live a better occupational and interpersonal life. That was the purpose. Beautifully said. And so in terms of where we go from here, uh, Yaku and Christine, I really don't know. Um, there is a profound sense of demoralization in society. And in my colleagues, uh, you guys might know this more than mm -hmm. I, as you've been holding consultation groups on this very issue. Um, yeah. My colleagues are extremely demoralized because patients are coming in now to their detriment, by the way, and to their, um, well, to their detriment, patients are coming in now with what I would call socially sanctioned reinforcement for pathology, mm. meaning mm. you used to be able to question things about people that were peculiar. If someone had a belief about the world that was not anchored in what you saw 
as reality, you wanted to help the person with that. And part of helping is to begin questioning why they would hold a belief, an attitude, have a behavioral pattern, et cetera. There are now domains of functioning, uh, race uh, being the most pronounced, uh, uh, gender competing right along with it, and others, not just those two, others, that are, the discussion is foreclosed. To even yes. uh, question someone's convictions along those domains and others would be to, to the patient or to a colleague or just another person, would be to expose you as the questioner, as being the progenitor of the social context of the woes that they're expressing to you. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, because people have become so narcissistically inclined, what happens? Well, now they feel a religious entitlement to discharge aggression onto you, right? We're getting yes. into narcissistic theory. Yes. And they do so without restraint. That's what we're seeing as cancel. That's what cancel mm -hmm. culture is. Mm -hmm. It is a religious fervor behind the discharge of aggression for the purposes of destruction toward an object that ceases to supply the self with gratification. Yes. Now, where we are is our colleagues are joining that cresting wave of narcissism, and we're left on the beach shore, looking at the crashes, wondering if we want to get in the water. Well, I'm in the water, yes. the two of you are. I'm not sure how many of our colleagues are going to try to swim through it. Yes. I don't either. I mean, I think somebody asked me a question about, um, you know, how do, how do these other therapists sl sleep at night? And my answer to that is, they can't look at the truth and the reality of what is happening, what they're doing and what they're saying, because they can't talk. They won't be able to tolerate that. It is too much and too overwhelming. So to get through it, they have had to reframe for themselves what it is that they're doing, the interventions they're using, their belief systems, the way they collude and align with children who are, you know, claiming to be trans and have gen gender dysphoria and all of that. Those kinds of actions are the only way that they can make sense of and try to be able to stay in the field and tolerate what's happening by reframing it as actually being something that's positive, right? And something that is helpful. And if I can't change it on a grander scale, well, I care about this person. And if this person has these viewpoints or thinks in this way, or these children that I'm working with who are in so much pain, you know, really believe this is the answer, who am I to tell them that that's not true? It's almost the playing on, in some way, the manipulation of the therapist themselves, in a way. They're being manipulated into, into believing that this is actually the way to go. And when questioned on or or proof or fa facts being delivered on why this might not be the right way it's well the pendulum will swing eventually it's well eventually we'll snap out of this well this is just a phase we'll outgrow it there isn't this deeper understanding that this is dire that we are in crisis that this is we are in peril and the dangers of this we have yet to even understand and scratch the surface as to what the dangers of this actually are and will be. This is not the same as the groups, the, the, hippie, the hippies of the 60s who are about free love and no war and whatever. This is not a trend that's going to swing back in the other direction. And that is the mentality that these people have. And if it isn't that, then the other part of it is Yes, but this person believes it, and I want to. I, I, I want to give to that person. I do think there's some intention there, of of do gooding. Mm -hmm. But like I said, there's also a a, a, a wa whitewashed understanding of the depths of how badly this is destroying our culture. We haven't, and we won't see the true effects probably for a decade. If I may jump in real quickly here. Um, Christine, I, I think that's very well put. Um, in my own ponderings as to where we are and if it's too late and so forth, every day it seems pretty crazy things are being brought to the surface that indicate to me that we may be too far gone as a society mm -hmm. to continue functioning uh, in a <laughs> reasonable manner. Uh, when I'm talking about gender, by the way, for the listeners, what I'm referencing is things like last week there was a story about an educator 
uh, somewhere in California, of course, who <laughs> believes that kids can identify as minotaurs. Minotaurs. And that that is a, a wonderful example of gender expansiveness. <laughs> well, when I get out of, the, out I mean, of bed in the morning, uh -huh. when I get out of bed in the morning as a clinical psychologist and I read stories like that while I'm drinking my coffee, I start to say, I think this is done. <laughs> Lucas. I, I mean, it's, just, it's laughable. It's laughable. Um, Yaku, I want to hear your take. I'm, I'm glad you're sitting down. I just read something today posted by Christopher Rufo on, on Twitter. An official document on the American Psychological Association on gender affirming care. One of the authors was Diane Ehrensaft. Now, Diane Ehrensaft has, if, 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 if ever there existed something like karma, she's one of those people with the dirtiest karma existing today because she knows very well what mm. social contagion is because she did research in the 80s and 90s hysteria around satanic ritual abuse. And she is a co-author of this document documenting several genders among children. Genders that we need to affirm. Hold your horses. Minotaur gender, like you said. Prius gender. Tesla gender. I mean, and, and, and several more. Official, official document. I mean, this is the recipe for disorientation and psychosis, fully à deux, fully en masse eh, among children. And they're actively instrumental in disorientating our children by the American Psychological Association. There is no it's just it's just a phase. It's it's just a phase. It'll pass. It'll pass. Yes, I say that right. with sarcasm, obviously, right, right. but the depths of this, yes. You know, something that I think people need to understand is that the, the, the radical gender theorists right now are using what I would call old school transgender people as a shield for something much different, something that we're all putting our fingers on now. I think it's slightly a separate issue, maybe even largely a separate issue. Uh, people who historically have sought to live as the opposite sex and have generally tried not to gain attention for that. In fact, mm -hmm. that's their whole aim is to not gain mm -hmm. attention for that. They'd like to live like the opposite sex and proceed that way. Um, I don't see that as the same issue necessarily as, the, um, as what we're describing here with people. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, uh, encouraging kids to identify as minotaurs. Um, I was on uh, a Newsmax a while back uh, um, talking about this issue uh, with respect to a social program in San Francisco. Uh, some of the categories included gender cowboy, um, a gender outlaw, that is, I'm sorry, gender cowboy not, might not be in there yet. They're working on it. Um, you know, gender fuck, uh, all of these things. And I had a question, uh, and I'd like to ask it to the two of you, and this is a tongue-in-cheek question. If you're doing gender-affirming care for a gender outlaw, how does that go? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, that goes, hey, here's a referral to another therapist. I don't, uh, this is beyond my scope of practice. That's my answer. Right. You see, you see it's, the, it's the, the wanton disregard for anything called reality. And yes. you know what makes the social justice warriors so annoying is that they believe that they're coming from a place of kindness and compassion and that we're coming from a place of cruelty and disregard for people's well-being. Well, excuse me, but if someone identifies as a gender cowboy or gender outlaw, I think I ought to help them with that distortion. Absolutely. And I think I'm more helpful doing that yeah. than yes. someone who says 
Absolutely. Well, yes. right, that's that's but a category. Is, and and yeah. this is where, to go back to what I said earlier, part of the problem was and is, is that some of these people, maybe most, I don't know, actually believe that because they care and have compassion, it is okay to have those kinds of belief systems and, and not question or challenge them because they themselves, you talk about counter transference, right? They themselves cannot tolerate or cannot handle upsetting a client that they believe is too fragile right. for the truth. Now, so Christine, you also have that I'm sorry. component. You, you, you've jumped the shark though, and you didn't notice it, but um, they don't have compassion. They have a word that they associate with something good. Yes. But compassion is not gratification. You were yes. leading there, but it's an important distinction to make. Yes. They're Thank gratifying you. people, but that's not compassionate. Yes. Compassionate is helping people function more fluidly they in wanna reality. Be, they want to be liked. It's not compassionate. Right. It's I want to be liked. That's I want right. the client to like me. I want to be good, et right. cetera. Correct. So here, here, here's so a that's trend. That's 100%. That is right. Right. It's not, so here, that's not actual compassion. Here's a trend that I've noticed and my colleagues have noticed. I'm curious if the two of you have noticed this as well. The younger generation does not develop transference the same way or at all as older generations. The reason that I find this to be extremely interesting is because Freud noticed that narcissistic personalities really were incapable of developing transference as he conceptualized it. And of course, the reason was that they have a, a, an impaired capacity mm -hmm. for um, investment in the analyst. Uh, Kernberg would put it as they have a fear of depending on the analyst. Yes. And yes. They, they, they maintain primary impulsive investment in the self. And so I, I, I think it's quite telling that the newest generation in the eyes of me and my colleagues have a much slower, if at all, development of transference toward the analyst seems to mm. speak to, in an empirical fashion, the growing narcissistic core in society mm -hmm. writ large. Yako, I want to hear about if you're, I, I'm not, as I said, I'm semi-retired from cl seeing clients, but Yako, I know you're in the yeah. thick of it. So I'd love to hear from you yeah. about that as well. In spite of their inability to develop transference in the therapeutic alliance, we still do. I have found, I have found the Mastersonian approach to the disorders of the self rather helpful in, in dealing with narcissistic clients. But not only that, and also in formulating what's happening in society, that it is an interesting phenomenon where, because we, we're finding ourselves in a victim society where someone who's victimized is the one that would earn all the social credits of, of society. So with grandiose narcissism there, the victimized groups, in other words. And then we have the closet narcissists, those who rush to their help, those who enable them, those with the toxic compassion or the toxic empathy, enabling these victims to remain entitled and disempowered and destructive. And then we have a subgroup, the devaluing narcissists, who are responsible for the actual disruption of society. Those who organize and mobilize and terrorize. And that has really helped me to see the, the woke movement in these three facets. Those who are victims, those who enable the victimhood, and those who actually destroy and then perform narcissistic reversal, when you clamp down on them, suddenly you're the oppressor. Right. Yeah, it's very Would well agree. stated. That that requires no elaboration on my end. Yeah. That is uh, uh, fini. I just think that it is a good indication that some prominent psychoanalysts are starting to speak out. That's well stated. And uh, if I might say in, in a point of closing, yes. um, I've been extremely fortunate to be influenced by other outspoken people. Uh, if you think of characters, giants, um, we stand on the shoulders of giants, right? Yes. As, as Newton said. 
uh, Thomas Sowell, mm-hmm. Milton Friedman, mm-hmm. uh, Dennis Prager, even. Oh, yes. Um, colleagues of mine, Mark McDonald, a very uh, outspoken uh, psychiatrist, uh, and others, uh, Richard Creighton, who I've had on my podcast a number oh, of times. Oh, it's amazing. Um, people who are not afraid to say things right out loud that yes. they believe are true. Mm-hmm. Yes. I think that if you're listening now, uh, you've got a duty to say things that you believe are true and to be honest yes. about the state of affairs in the world. Uh, that's the only way a groundswell occurs. And I hope it grows. So uh, thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Lucas. It was such a pleasure. Mm -hmm.